Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this IIEA webinar um, this uh, this Wednesday lunchtime. My name is Liz Carolyn um, of the Briefing.ie. Um, I do some work with the IIEA around digital policy, uh, which is an area that I work in. I am not an expert in German politics and government, which is why I'm absolutely delighted and very, very excited that we're joined here today by somebody who is, and that is Derek Scali, who many of you will know um, uh, from his brilliant work, um, two decades of work at the Irish Times. And he's been generous enough to take to generous enough to take time out of his very busy schedule uh, in order to speak with us today. Um, this is Derek's third time, I believe, doing one of these kind of political year in reviews uh, on German politics for uh, for the IIEA. Um, I don't know if there has been a year as eventful as this one. <laughs> especially uh, um, a month or two as eventful as the last month or two has been in German politics. Um, so just, I guess, some basic housekeeping before I hand over. Derek's going to be speaking to us for about 20 minutes, um, and then we're going to have a and a with you guys um, in the audience. Um, you'll be able to join the discussion using, so there's a Q&A function in Zoom that you should see um, uh, on your screen. Um, please do feel free to send in your questions throughout the session. So as, um, as Derek is talking, anything interesting that comes into your mind, pop it in there. I would ask that you include your kind of name and affiliation, just so then when I come to pulling on those questions, um, I can attribute them um, to you. Um, and we'll come on to those once Derek is uh, finished his presentation. Um, just just uh, to let you know, so today's presentation and the Q&A are both on the record. Uh, so this um, this session is being recorded. Um, feel free to, to talk about it if you want to use the uh, IIEA Twitter handle. It is at IIEA. I'm not sure if IIEA are on uh, Blue Sky yet. Um, uh, but we also have, uh, we're live streaming this afternoon. So welcome to everybody who is tuning in on YouTube. Um, so um, I'm going to just formally introduce Derek Scally and hand over to him. Uh, he's a native Dubliner, studied up there in DCU, but also then over in Humboldt University in Berlin, uh, where he's been the Irish Times correspondent since 2001. He covers business, politics, culture. He's a regular contributor to, to German news, outs, news outlets, including uh, Die Zeit Weekly and uh, Deutsche Landfunk uh, WDR Radio. Uh, he also reports regularly from Northern Europe, and he is the author of the brilliant book, uh, The Best Catholics in the World, which was published in 2021 by Penguin. Um, so Derek, over to you. Um, I'm very excited to hear about uh, your interpretation of this very tumultuous year in German politics. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you to the IA team and thank you for everyone who's joining us. Um, we should probably start with a disclaimer. There's this rule about reporting on German politics, which I've picked up on in the few years. First of all, you, you imagine the most interesting thing that can happen and then you imagine the most boring thing that can happen. Your money in German politics, it's the boring thing that will happen. <laughs> Germans like boring. Germans like stability. As somebody said, we had quite enough excitement in the 20th century for two centuries. But last month was actually an interesting exception to the rule of, you know, will the interesting thing happen or the boring thing happen? Uh, it was the evening of November 6th. Um, I was sitting here hoping for a, a quiet, a quiet evening. Uh, and suddenly we got news that there was going to be a, an emergency press conference with Olaf Scholz. Um, Olaf Scholz came to power in 2021. He was sort of a soft-spoken, dog-eared briefcase carrying um, chancellor, a social democrat. And he went in front of the cameras and he basically turned into what I described as Scholzilla. He just went on a rampage. He, he just said minutes earlier he had fired his finance minister, his liberal finance minister, Christian Lindner, at a very heated meeting in the chancellery. And then he basically went on to run amok by German standards in front of the cameras. He said that Lindner, his finance minister for the last three years, was an untrustworthy person who broke promises repeatedly and prioritized, I quote, petty party politics. His own vote and the short-term survival of his own party over the good of the country. And Schultz said to the cameras, I want to spare the country further behavior, and there's no basis of trust for a further cooperation. Uh, 
took a few minutes for Lindner to hit back also over the airwaves. And he called his former boss. Uh, he was too dull, quote, dull and lacking ambition to revive Germany's beleaguered economy, let alone its business model. Um, Christian Lindner is the man who refused the offer from Angela Merkel a few years ago to go into politics. And he said memorably, I prefer not to govern than to govern badly. So after three years of, I think everyone will admit, governing badly, he decided um, that he didn't want to have anything to do with this government to which he had previously been a member. So, you know, it's not exactly Trump, but by German standards, this is hot stuff. And everyone was agog. Um, the next day, um, everyone was talking about it. Uh, Angela Merkel said last week, she said, hmm, of course, after you do this, the fireworks are great and you get lots of applause from your own, from your own camp. But she said, sometimes it's better just to shout at the office wall. Anyway, um, we're a month on. Um, should he have shouted at the office wall? Was he right to pull the plug? Um, back briefly on how we got here. I'll give a quick overview of where we are and some thoughts on where we're going. Um, so before we go on, I think it's very fashionable um, in the chattering classes, particularly in, in Germany, to dismiss this government that has just effectively collapsed, the so-called traffic light coalition, um, as the worst government Germany ever had. You know, No discussion. It's the worst ever. And I really won't join that chorus because um, yeah, it's difficult to get a proper perspective. I think hot takes, there's enough people out there doing hot takes these days. Um, and I think at this perspective, it's fair to say this government is always going to have a difficulties. It was always going to be a tightrope walk. Um, and circumstances often beyond its control made it fall off the tightrope. But I mean, we're always going to be dealing with three very different parties. Let's look at the components. So we had three parties. We had a social democratic party uh, with an ascendant left wing, and they came to power determined to reverse what they viewed as the economic welfare, economic reform failures, uh, betrayals of the Schroeder era. So they from behind, they won. They weren't expecting to win, but they won the election with 25.7 percent. They were just one point ahead of the center right Christian Democrats. So they squeezed in. Let's be honest. They didn't quite believe they would, and they never, because they were sort of drunk with this, we got back in. They never really reflected that it was actually their second worst result in the post-war history. So this was no triumph, but they were acting as if they had some huge mandate. The second party was the Green Party. They got 15%, which was its best ever result. Um, and so they went into power, convinced voters were ready to have them back, ready for some serious investment in sort of a, a Green Deal, um, a transformation of Germany's industrial economy to something that might make, let's say, fewer diesel cars, but maybe more e-cars or machines that would transfer, make, make, make Germany a superpower in terms of climate shift the post-industrial climate economy and then the third party was this liberal free democrats they were effectively a neoliberal party and they saw their mandate as bringing germany back to business as usual particularly on budgets um until the pandemic germany was balancing its budget it was encouraging forcing everyone else in europe to do the same and it considered this as sensible uh, sustainable politics and the free democrats with their you know, business doctor, lawyer, but voter base felt that this is their mandate. So um, if you look at those three parties, very different parties, very different, um, you know, two parties prepared to spend more, another party determined to cut back. Uh, but you could see if you look back at their coalition agreement, they really were trying to at least build an imaginary bridge, whether or not it would for work in reality. They were promising, quote, a progressive transformation of Germany's economy, of its infrastructure and its welfare. A lot of what people are shouting now that Germany needs to do, they said, maybe we can make this work because the Social Democrats had worked with both the Free Democrats and the Greens at various points in the past, and they had done some good things. So why shouldn't it work three in one? Um, but there were two big lightning bolts that um, put an end to their dreams, their dreams of you know, massive infrastructure investment um, and also balancing the budget. Just the first lightning bolt was, of course, Russia's uh, full scale invasion of Ukraine um, and just the, the watershed, the Zeitenbender that Olaf Scholz announced in Parliament. So this was a 100 billion special fund for investment in Germany's own military and also um, taboo shattering, taboo shattering arms deliveries to Ukraine worth about 15 to 28 billion, so depending on how you count, but you know, up to 30 billion, almost 30 billion in arms to Ukraine. And again, I'd like to point out something very easy to forget. 
this is a huge, huge deal for Germany. Um, I mean, Germany, it just completely scrambled Germany's post-war understanding of itself, its pacifist post-war self-image. And it had never before shipped weapons to a party of war. So it just decided overnight to do that. And I would argue that, you know, it's a, it's as much of a watershed as Germany's participation in the military, the NATO um, participation in, in, in Kosovo. And that was Germany's first overseas war deployments in 49. It was a huge debate. But this supplying arms to a party of war is... Is, is it was unprecedented. It was a taboo, and Olaf Scholz did it overnight, and has been continuing to supply ever since, up to twenty eight billion of equipment. So um, Germany feels very hard done by it from people who are saying, "Well, why aren't you doing this? And why aren't you doing that?" And Germany is saying, "Well, why aren't you doing anything?" Um, Reminds me a bit of the debate over bailouts. It was very easy to say, "Germany, why don't you back bailouts?" But that looks obvious from the outside, but from a at just how much convincing uh, you have to do with, with uh, German voters, how much resistance you're going to face in the domestic political front. So supplying arms to Ukraine is a bit like bailouts, just even with the stakes even higher. Um, it's also worth pointing out that Russia's invasion has completely scrambled the German political spectrum. I mean, you have the Greens with their roots in the peace movement are now the most vocal supporters of Ukraine. And they're demanding that um, Olaf Scholz provide more weapons, more lethal weapons to Ukraine than he is prepared to supply. Um, but of course, the invasion caught when it's pants down. Um, when Angela Merkel left office, Germany bridged the gap between, it had just closed down its nuclear plants and it was moving to a future of renewables, but there was a gap in its energy needs. And that gap was supposed to be filled with um with natural gas. And Russia, by the time Angela Merkel left office, was supplying six of that gas. So that's an awful lot of eggs in one energy basket. And of course, we know what happened. Nord Stream 1 and 2 blown up, um, forced Germany to find energy. It did. It kept the heat. It kept the lights on. It kept it on. And I think um, it's, again, it's easy to say, oh, well, Germany shouldn't have gotten into this situation. Well, it was in this situation and it got out of the situation. So I think that's definitely something that this government can say. We managed to keep, we inherited a lot of dependencies and we worked to reverse those dependencies and they worked quickly. Think about it, the, the Schultz government in its original form existed for 78 days. And the government came in with one coalition agreement Vladimir Putin just effectively dropped a nuclear bomb on the post-war order. And the, the new government, the, the, the still new government in Germany had to reassert, reassert its priorities. Um, but you could say it didn't quite communicate that with the public. It never went back into its coalition agreement and said, OK, all bets are off. We have to do a new deal. What can we afford? What can't we not afford? And communicate that to the people. And on the the tragedy, because I think there was a lot that could have been done with this government. There's a lot that needs to be done in Germany. Let's be honest. Putin's war, a lot of that won't be, wouldn't have been achievable by this government. But I think even without Putin, this government probably would have fallen short of its own lofty goals because um, it was pursuing government policy with sort of budgetary magical thinking. Um, and the political thinking came to an end about a year ago when the German's constitutional court it threw out the 2024 budget saying there's too much of this which is based on um, creative accounting and um, that in particular the repurposing of old pandemic funding for new spending, in particular climate funding. So they were saying, you said this was an emergency, the pandemic, you said you were just going to raise limited funding. And now this unspent funding is now going to be used for future policies. No, that's not in line with the Constitution. So the Constitutional Court basically threw out their creative account. That allowed Christian Lindner, the Liberal Finance Minister, to say, oh, you see, I told you so. We have to go back to the old Merkel idea of austerity, of balanced budgets. We have to get Germany back to a post-pandemic norm, which resembles the pre-pandemic norm, which is balanced budgets. And also the debt break, where Germany cannot um, raise more than 0.35% of its gross domestic product in, in, in loans. So budget cuts were back. Um, massive cuts were lined up. And for somebody like Olaf Scholz, who's more of a centrist liberal than a leftist, he didn't have any problem with that, except until a month ago, when all the coalition fell apart. And suddenly Scholz came out saying, um, 
um, Christian Lindner's fiscal and finance policies were irresponsible, that Germany needed a transformation, needed more fiscal flexibility. Um, we need to have more support for Ukraine and we cannot play balanced budgets, responsible housekeeping uh, against the supporting Ukraine. Uh, we need to retool Germany's industrial base. We need to pr protect Germany and Europe against sort of a Trump 2.0 protectionist push. Um, so, and on the other hand, we had Crystal Lindner saying, well, you know, the only the trouble with this government is we kept thinking we could throw money at it, or there were too many people thinking we could just throw money at a problem. Uh, and money was the only thing that made our, our coalition compatible. So that's the, um, that's where we are. Or that's where we were a month ago. What's happened in the month since? Um, the SPD made a huge strategic mistake. Scholz was suddenly the most popular man after three years of sort of speaking in a monotone of three years of being a very uncharismatic leader. He just came out in these Scholzilla fireworks. And instead of seizing the moment, the SPD could have said, this is our man. Look at this leadership. Um, this is our man for a second term, our and future chancellor. They hesitated and he who hesitates is lost. And what happened then was people after the flash of this Scholzilla moment, uh, people looked at the, the polls and they realized, oh yeah, Olaf Scholz is the 19th most popular person in the country. Have we got anyone else? Oh, we do. We've got a man called Boris Pistorius, our defense minister. He's the most popular man in the country. Why don't we have him as our chancellor? Scholz is not party leader. Scholz was nominated and he can also be unnominated. And the party, rather than acting quickly to squash this and, and Pistorius, rather than acting quickly to say, no, we already have a strong leader, this speculation continued for um, weeks. And it only, only in the last week did Pistorius pull out of a race he claimed he never wanted to be a part of, but didn't want to back away from. Scholz has said, I am the man. The party says, the party leadership says we want him. And early in January, he will be officially crowned as the chancellor candidate, the chancellor as the chancellor candidate for a second term. But huge amounts of trust and the the, the disagreement and the uncertainty within the SPD were plain for all to see. I, I have two political, local political parties of the SPD I talked to. One is here in Berlin and the other is in Dortmund, which is a real SPD stronghold. And in both cases, they're both divided. They say, well, of course, we'll support shots now. He's... He's the man for the job. He's we've been told he is the man, but many people at local level say, I don't want to put up this for Olaf Scholz. He's not, he's not our Chancellor. So if 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 the if the SPD party uh, officials aren't convinced, how will they convince voters? So the timetable is a confidence motion which, which will be tabled by Olaf Scholz on December 16th. It's a constructive confidence motion, which means he knows he will lose it. He doesn't have a majority. The FDP uh, aren't going to back him. He will then go to the president. The president has already signaled that he's not going to look around for other majorities. He's obliged to ask other parties, could you imagine forming a government with a different uh, majority? And that means um, Parliament will be dissolved and will probably have elections on the 23rd of February. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a curious time since. I was talking to some government officials last week and we all agreed nobody seems to miss this government. The government has collapsed. There's no official budget for this year. But it's actually quite calm because it's just been at least a year of, of bickering. So everyone seems to be drawing breath. But it does say a lot about the government that it has collapsed, that nobody seems to miss. Um, I was just watching just now, Olaf Scholz was in um, Parliament. He was uh, answering questions. And considering the challenges ahead and considering the mess that he's left the country in and the challenges of the government of the of the snap election, well, snap election, three months instead of three weeks, um, that's, that's German snap election for you. Uh, they just seem to be, it was just the usual debate, arguing about rental breaks, arguing about welfare policy, arguing about single mothers. And nobody's really asking the big questions. You know, the, the big question is, what is Germany there for? What does Germany do? How does Germany earn its money? How does Germany pay its bills? Um, because we see, uh, the, you know, the economics of Germany, the country's basically skirting recession in its second year now. The big companies from Volkswagen, Tucson Krupp, the steel company, um, are struggling. I was just down in Wolfsburg. I'm doing a long read on basically Volkswagen is Germany. Volkswagen's model of sort of co-determination between workers 
and uh, management is really under threat. It's not just the seems to want the, the model it seems to be. And I think you could, without extending this metaphor too much, but the, the Volkswagen model was the post-war model and the post-war model of Germany is now seems to be threat like never before. And yet there seems to be a certain amount of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, at least if you follow the Bundestag debates. Um, you have the Scholz SPD is on 15, 16%. That's half the size of uh, the Christian Democrats. Um, they are quite confident they will finish first on 32%. Interestingly, Friedrich Merz, who's the head of the, the new head of the um, centre-right CDU, he's only a few points ahead of Scholz in polls, so he's not a very popular figure. Um, but, um, I mean, the idea of the SPD making up 15 points in three months, hmm, we'll see. I, it seems quite unlikely. So the smart money seems to be on yet another grand coalition, um, CDU and SPD. They did it one, two, three times with, Mer uh, with Merkel. Um, and Merz, what has he promised to do differently? He's retooled the CDU. He seems to have moved it more centre-right as opposed to centre um a tougher line on immigration he's obviously got the far right afd uh, alternative for germany over his shoulder um and uh he's seen the rise of the afd and also a left conservative populist party the bundes sache wagenknecht the leftist populist uh, sache wagenknecht i could go into them in great that to the questions and um, uh, q and a Kurtz has said it's the economy, the, the, the party people trust most to reform, to revive the German economy will win the election. I think it's like a safe, obvious thing to say. And most people trust the CDU to do that. Um, but this election will leave him maybe struggling for, if he decides, no, I don't want another grand coalition. You know, the FDP, Christian Lindner's party is struggling on 5%, which is the cutoff for parliamentary representation. And the AFD is in place with 18, 19% in polls. So this could be a very different um, new Bundestag if right. Um, is heading into. I talk about sorry, Derek, I talk we might be having a few kind of sound issues there. Is there anything happening your end connection wise? Switch off the, uh, I'll switch off the. Sometimes the, sometimes oh. the uh, AirPods give up. I was actually finishing up there. Um, so I could talk a bit about Merkel and a new biography. I could talk about the smaller parties, but I think after 20 minutes, I've talked enough. Um, so we're heading really into uncertain, unprecedented territory. Um, the Social Democrats, Olaf Scholz could be a one-term chancellor. It's looking quite likely. He's unlikely to join uh, a coalition under Friedrich Merz as foreign minister or finance minister. Um, but I would say the safe money is on a CDU SPD grand coalition after the February election. Mm -hmm.